I shall try to explain these details as clearly as possible. I have said I received emails that appeared to be making fun of Regent's death. You probably understood I do not know who sent those 200 emails. I visualize the sender of these 200 or so emails as a lone mail but see them as a group of one or more individuals. The senders had not disclosed their real names. They had also properly concealed their IP address and geolocation. I think it was natural for the senders to conceal their identities because their actions would be deemed unethical if not illegal. I gave names to these incoming emails. I called them the Gummy Bear Series and the Graveyard Series. The very first email which arrived on March 25th was of the Gummy Bear Series. The first email of the Graveyard Series came after Regent's death. Each email of each series had unique content. There was a logical progression of content with time. The sender of the Gummy Bear series called themselves Jasmine, which is a girl's name. The sender of the Graveyard series of emails went by a different name. For starters, the Gummy Bear series of emails referred to a movie called Gummy Bear. The movie was about a cartoon character called Gummy Bear, and a diagram of him was sent to me. These emails said something about 8 billion people watching the Gummy Bear movie and giving it a good review. I was urged to invest money in Gummy Bear. 8 billion people can't be wrong, the emails said. I don't think the world's population reached 8 billion in 2014. Therefore the information in the Gummy Bear emails was spurious. I suspected that Gummy Bear referred to Regent himself, based on his physical appearance being fat and podgy. I suspected that the senders were calling Regent a movie, because he was now dead, and would be nothing more than a legend remembered by a lot of people. If you want, you can ask me to go screw my suspicions. But let us continue with my story. I happen to have a real niece called Jasmine. She was around 17 at the time. I have never met her, and she lives in the UK. She happens to be the daughter of my younger sister Mrs. VW who is the plaintiff of my trumped criminal conviction, along with her husband Mr. SPW, a scientist of the Atomic Weapons Establishment. People say ignorantly, irresponsibly, go to the press, they will help you. The press does not help anyone with miscarriages of justice. The press does not examine your proof that a sensational event took place. Your story generally needs official recognition before the press will print it. I continue with my story. The gummy bear emails were sent by a namesake of my niece. The long version of these emails referred to an acting school in Brighton. My mother Rada had said before the criminal conviction that my niece Jasmine was interested in acting, drama, and movie stars, and becoming one herself. A few days after March 25th, I received a phone call with its number withheld. The caller had a young female voice and introduced herself as Jasmine. She urged me to invest money in Gummy Bear and other beloved movies. I have never met or spoken to my niece Jasmine. However, I could tell right away that the caller could not have possibly been my niece. That's because the caller had a regional twang. She was unmistakably a native speaker of English. I have never known an Anglo-Indian, which my niece is, to sound like that. I would expect Jasmine to sound like her mother which is like ethnic minority newsreaders sound on the BBC. If she were to sound like her father I doubt she would she would sound Mancunian. The caller Jasmine was country, with a different regional accent. I ruled out that she could be my relative. The long version of the gummy emails had numbers from Regent's address, and the address of the registrar of the domain used by the sender coincided with his place of birth, Tunbridge Wells. The last coincidence is somewhat remarkable, although not impossible. If Regent's birthplace had been London, and the domain used by the sender was with a registrar whose company address was in London, we could dismiss there was any coincidence. After all, there would be hundreds of domain registrars in London. This concludes my description of the Gummy Bear email series of the days before, and after Regent's death and multiple pieces of information in these emails that seemed to make hints at Regent and my blood relatives. If a reader is not familiar with domain registrars, this will be explained further on. I gave the Graveyard series its name because a graveyard was their subject. 
and their sender was not called Jasmine. This was a graveyard company. They wanted me to buy an unused grave, and resell it at a profit a few years later. This refers to the UK running out of burial plots and more people opting for cremations. The email said you cannot avoid death sometimes, but you can make money out of it. The graveyard company had the name ICI. This name coincided with the name of my father's former employer, also ICI, which stood for Imperial Chemical Industries. There was one more connection or so-called coincidence. The location of the grave plots was Basingstoke. This is probably the closest graveyard to my sister, Vigil Wortley, who lives in Pamber Heath, near the awe.co.uk, the Atomic Weapons Establishment, where my brother-in-law works. This concludes my description of features and coincidences of the so-called graveyard series that arrived in the days immediately after Regent's death. This section explains how the two email series developed with time. I saw the last email around September 2014. Firstly, both email series that names Gummy Bear and Graveyard series had references or they were an amazing coincidence, that they contained information about Regent and my family members historically. Since I felt the two series were mocking Regent's passing, I did not think two separate culprits sent the two email series independently of each other. I concluded there is only one culprit I visualize as a solo male, but count them as a group of one or more people. I call him or them the culprit, the party that sent the emails. Physically I could think of no one who would know my parents and sister, based in West Reading and the Basingstoke area, and Regent of Shifnal, Shropshire, whom I met on Facebook. He is an Englishman who had nothing to do with my parents. My parents were elderly. My father had retired long ago. They had been in the UK since 2006. My father's neighbors and friends in the neighborhood of neighbors where he had bought a home in 2006, were not likely to know who his previous employer was, let alone who his latest employer was, from whom he had retired. Such deep knowledge of my family members would make none but my family members themselves, qualify as the culprit. But how would they know Regent? I have not solved the mystery of the culprit's identity, however, will present my conclusions and how I arrived at them. I plan to be simple short and easy to understand. In the months that followed, right up to September 2014, the emails changed their message. They pretended I had notified Macmillan's, a UK cancer charity, that I had cancer. The subsequent emails were pretending to be from Macmillan's, and how they were organizing a coffee morning for me. The emails said things like, Mahini, dying from cancer can be fun. As time progressed the emails became more hush-hush in mood and indicated my cancer was growing worse. The parting shot was an email, with the subject line, Hersom, why don't you die? The email asked to buy a million dollar life insurance policy, and commit suicide. The interesting thing is that around the time the emails stopped arriving, September 2014, the email that arrived on March 25th was deleted. I realized it had been there the last time I logged in, and subsequently had disappeared. I reckoned maybe the culprit had got my password, got in, and deleted this evidence about himself. But I had already PDF printed the March 25th email. I realize no one is interested in the evidence, However, the culprit was too late to destroy it. Why is this evidence significant? It is the only piece of evidence that proves that the culprit knew of Regent's death before it came. Why is such premature knowledge significant? Because we assume that the culprit was not a medical professional. And we feel Regent's doctor, would likely be the first person to predict that Regent's death was imminent. People close to Regent, namely myself and his sister Crystal, had no clue he was going to die, when I received the March 25th email. We realized that someone else knew. Who could that someone else be? I can personally testify that when I took leave of Regent on March 17th, he did not know he was soon to die. He did believe his health was deteriorating. He said so and blamed an unknown preparation administered by Dr. B that was getting him all worse. 
Regent did mention that Dr. B had told him that he wanted to stay immersed in a bathtub of warm water because his body could not maintain temperature anymore. There was no indication the regent interpreted this as death being around the corner. I did not like it, but not being medically trained, I did not think of the possibility he was dying. When I left him, regent intended to come to London and attend the April Book Fair and British Library to hear bird and animal sounds with me. We were going to see medical specialists together. He was even on the 20th or 21st on the phone with me from Schiffnell to London, he was keen and said he had no energy to walk around a book fair so he was just coming to see doctors. I remember him squealing enthusiastically, I am in I am in. A much neglected creature, he became exuberant that someone cared. I can say therefore that even 72 hours before he died, Regent wasn't sure he was about to die. Which of us is sure we are about to die before it happens? You would be if your doctor told you. Let's say this culprit knew Regent would die any minute on March 25th. Since we do not believe the culprit is a medical professional, we see him as a third party who had this information. Who gave this third party that kind of confidential doctor information? While Regent died of medical neglect, and there is an unconfirmed allegation by him that his GP was giving something that was hastening his departure, we interpret this as medical neglect and euthanasia of someone the doctor felt would be better off dead. The fact that some non-medical guy who gloats over Regent's death receives confidential doctor information gives the story a brand new dimension.